Thank you very much for having me. And I'm going to present to you uh, results of the research that have been conducted with a colleague of mine at the university. And the research or the project is called When Justice is Done. Because back in the time, I think it was like three years ago, we were wondering actually what happens to perpetrators who are convicted by the tribunals. Because a lot of scholarship is about victims, about severity of punishment, about modes of liability. But there have been not any attention actually dedicated to imprisonment, incarceration, reintegration of these perpetrators. So we started this project and uh, I'm going to start with two stories. Zoran Vukovic was a member of a Bosnian Serb paramilitary unit in Foča during the war in Bosnia in 1990s. He was also one of the defendants at the ICTY in one of the first trials which dealt with sexual violence during wartime. He was convicted of a rape of a minor. And this victim actually testified against him during his trial. And she said that he raped her. And after lighting a cigarette, said that he could have done more if she had not reminded him of his daughter. She was 15 at the time. Vukovic was sentenced to 12 years in prison and was sent to Norway. In Norway, he was placed in a small provincial prison in a small town in Bodo, which is at the very north of Norway. And in this prison, usually local drug dealers or petty criminals are serving their very short sentences for basically minor offenses. So Vukovic became actually a permanent resident of the prison. But he didn't speak Norwegian. His English was not very good, so he had problems in communicating with the prison staff. Due to prohibitive costs, he was never visited by his family, who was still in Bosnia. But he behaved well in prison, so was transferred to a more lenient ward. And in order to mitigate his circumstances and also reward him for his good behavior, he was allowed to have a computer in his cell, and he was also allowed to go on a frequent trips outside of the prison. So he went Nordic skiing, he worked at the local football stadium. So we have a convicted rapist who was actually never subjected to any rehabilitation program. He was never subjected to any psychological assessment. He was never asked to talk about his crimes, but he behaved well in prison. After serving two thirds of his sentence, the ICTY president decided that Vukovic is sufficiently rehabilitated, pardoned the rest of his sentence, and let him go. Vukovic entered the plane to Sarajevo, and nobody has heard of him since. Vukovic was one of the many hands-on perpetrators, actually food soldiers that were tried at the ICTY. But ICTY also dealt with generals or high-ranking politicians the ones who actually steered or supervised others to commit crimes, such as Veselin Slivanchanin. Slivanchanin was a major in the People's Yugoslav Army during the war, and he was convicted in 2010 for 10 years for his involvement in torture of hundreds of prisoners of war at Ovčara Farm in Vukovar in Croatia. He was granted early release six months after his trial ended, because his trial was very lengthy. And his early release was justified by the fact that he behaved well in detention, he worked in a library, and he expressed sympathy for the victims of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. He was never asked about his outlook on his crimes, how he basically reflects back. So he returned to Belgrade, received a heroic welcome, wrote a book, which is entitled I Defended the Truth on his unfair treatment at the ICTY, and regularly actually frequented TV shows in Serbia where he claimed that we, he would have done the same or he did not regret what he did in Vukovar. I think that these two stories very nicely actually demonstrate the reality of rehabilitation at international criminal tribunals. I think that this aspiration is not properly thought through and implemented, and the assessment of rehabilitation at the tribunals is flawed. So uh, what is offender rehabilitation? 
just to start very broadly. Offender rehabilitation is in general defined as a process of change towards a specified objective. But what the objectives are and how to achieve them is not clear or there is no consensus about it. So in general, like one overarching objective is to prevent reoffending. But there can be many others, such as successful reintegration to society, a moral change of offender, or uh, healing broken societal relationships. And these obje objectives are tried to be achieved by a variety of different programs. For example, the radicalization programs for terrorists, victim offender mediation, cognitive behavioral programs in prison, work, education, you name it. I think that there are as many versions of rehabilitation as many different countries in the world. So there is basically no consensus about what offender rehabilitation actually entails. How is offender rehabilitation relevant at international criminal courts? I think there are two main stages where, when, when it is important. First, it is cited as a goal of punishing perpetrators. And secondly, and more importantly, it is actually one of the criterium for granting early release to those who were convicted after they have served a part of their sentence. So how do inter international prisoners actually serve their sentences? There is no international prison. So uh, those convicted by the tribunals are sent to countries which are willing to accept them, which in practice means that, for example, ICTY prisoners were spread around 14 different European countries. ICTR prisoners, on the other hand, mainly serve their or are serving their sentences in Mali and Benin. And you can imagine that there are very large differences in prison conditions, prison regimes, or rehabilitation programs these prisoners are subjected to in these different countries, just only within Europe. If you think uh, about Scandinavia, Scandinavia is known for its focus on rehabilitation and offender reintegration. And some of the ICTY prisoners, indeed, have served part of their sentences in open prisons or halfway houses. But this can be compared to France or Italy, which are much more punitively or retributively oriented. So their majority of the prisoners are sent to high security prison, prisons. But it's also, I think, important to realize that prison officials across these different countries have not much experience with rehabilitating perpetrators that are tried at the international level. If you think about it, we are talking about ex-soldiers, generals, politicians, so who committed their crimes actually during wars or power struggles. So what does it mean to rehabilitate these perpetrators? And I will read out a quote of a prison director of the prison where Vukovic was, uh, was serving uh, his sentence when we conducted interviews with prison officials across European countries. And we asked her what rehabilitation program he was subjected to, and this is what she told us. I don't think we talked about the specific crimes. It felt unpleasant. It was so terrible. I felt I couldn't ask him in a way to protect myself. We perhaps protected ourselves. It was so strange to us. Such terrible things had been done. It was unusual to have inmates who had committed such violence. For normal crimes, we have programs. Programs like breaking drug abuse or breaking violence. Many prisoners go to these programs. They talk in group sessions or individually about the crimes. But what competence do we have to deal with them? We are only simple prison officers knowing about life in Bordeaux. We are not educated in these matters. So I think this quote is quite telling. However, no matter where and how international prisoners serve their sentences, they are all eligible for early release after serving two thirds. And all of them do use this opportunity and apply for early release. The early release is decided by the president of the tribunal, and this is the point of time where he evaluates their level of rehabilitation. And judging from the practice, 
we are very, very successful in rehabilitating international prisoners. So for example, uh, at the ICTY, so far there have been 82 final convictions. Out of these, 54 individuals were already released. 58 individuals were already released. And out of these 58, 54 were actually early released, which means that 93% was considered sufficiently rehabilitated to have part of their sentences pardoned. They were let free without any conditions or monitoring. So, we have almost 100% success rate in rehabilitating war criminals and genocidaires. Well, is this a cause for celebration? I guess that you already suspect that I will say no. And I think that the main problem is the way how rehabilitation of perpetrators of international crimes is applied and interpreted. So what the president does at the early release stage is that he doesn't have any guidance in law or policy documents. So he relies on information that is submitted to him either by the prisoner himself or the prison authorities. And we reviewed all the early release decisions at the tribunal, so ICTY, ICTR mainly. And uh, the evaluation seems to be very ad hoc. There is no systematic or consistent approach. There are different factors emphasized differently in different decisions. But if you sort of take, take them all together, there are four main categories of factors that are basically taken into account to demonstrate prisoners rehabilitation. In all decisions, the president discusses behavior in prison which is often the only factor that is taken into account. Sometimes he also looks at future prospects of a prisoner, which are often based on prisoners' own declaration. So when they say that they will go back to their families or take on a job, that's enough. In some of the decisions, the president also looks at reflection on crimes. But what I find particularly striking is that it is not given that the, prison, uh, that the president actually discusses how prisoner looks back at what he did. So acknowledgement of responsibility, or not to say remorse, is not necessary at all. And finally, the fourth category relates to individual circumstances, such as good character prior to crime or health considerations. So how does sufficiently rehabilitated war criminal, according to the tribunals, look like? He behaves well in prison, participates in language courses, or library work, or works in a kitchen brigade during his incarceration. He has some idea what he is going to do after his release. He is not asked to reflect on his crimes or harm caused by atrocities. He does not have to acknowledge his responsibility. So it happened sometimes that even those who were in denial and kept on justifying what they did were actually early released. So, I think the assessment of rehabilitation at international criminal tribunals does not make so much of a sense, especially if we look at the type of crimes we are dealing with and type of individuals. And I'm going to pose many questions actually now, which I hope to answer by the end of the evening. So, how can the fact that an army general who participated in language courses during his prison time demonstrate his rehabilitation for, let's say, ordering massacre of civilians? Or take an ex-soldier who was tried for killings within the same massacre, which he committed, committed after following orders of this general? How would the fact that he behaves according to rules and orders of prison authorities demonstrate his rehabilitation? Or think about politicians or conflict entrepreneurs who are often the ones inciting others to commit atrocities. If they are never asked to reflect on their deeds, there is no surprise that they keep on justifying what they did. Especially, I think, since they have hardly ever made their hands dirty and often feel unjustifiably prosecuted. I'm not saying that it is always possible to make individuals acknowledge wrongfulness of their actions. And I think that it is 
basically our normal human psychological defense mechanism to justify and neutralize what we did. But if one is never asked to reflect on what he did, then considered rehabilitated and early released, even if still in denial, I think there is something wrong with the system. Especially given the fact that the crimes the tribunals are dealing with are often ideologically and politically motivated. And the perpetrators are the ones who steered others to commit atrocities. After their release, some of them go back to their societies, are celebrated as war heroes, and considered symbols of their own group victimization, such as Sivan Chanin and many others in Serbia or Croatia. Some become active in politics again, some in education of younger generations, and they keep on justifying their deeds. I think that we need to pause, take a deep breath and think for a while. What do we want to achieve by rehabilitating perpetrators of international crimes? Is rehabilitation actually an appropriate goal of international criminal justice? Or shall we just get rid of it, let perpetrators serve their punishment, their just desert, and leave it with that?